Greetings, I'm Dr. Thomas Allison, Associate Professor of Medicine at Mayo Clinic. During today's roundtable review, we will be discussing returning to specific LDL cholesterol goals. I'm joined by my colleagues, Dr. Francisco Lopez Jimenez and Dr. Stephen Kopesky. Uh, both are experts and specialize in cholesterol management. Welcome, uh, Steve and Francisco. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Tom. The new cholesterol guidelines are now nearly two years old, but LDL cholesterol goals haven't seemed to have gone away. Do you still think it's inappropriate do you, to have a goal for LDL cholesterol? Do you use a goal in your practice? Steve, uh, let, me, let me ask you that first. Yeah, Tom, I, I still do use goals. I, I like goals. We're a numbers society, and a couple of pieces of science push us towards goals. You know, we know that from intravascular ultrasound studies that coronary artery regression starts to occur below LDLs of 80. And plus, remember the COURAGE study had a goal of 80 LDL. I was one of the investigators. You were an investigator. Yeah. That's right. right. Dr. Gao here was one of the uh, PIs. And it showed that if you had uh, optimal medical therapy with a goal of 80, you didn't really need angioplasty. So we have good science behind it. Francisco, how about you? Yes, I, I do believe that there is a role for goals. Um, I think it's important to understand the reason behind uh, the recommendation to use intensity-based uh, therapy. That's what the clinical trials were based on, um, cholesterol medicine versus uh, a placebo, high-intensity, low-intensity statin. However, I think it's also important to recognize that we uh, do believe that uh, cholesterol has a threshold at which, at some point, it will cause uh, harm, and therefore, leaving patients with a, val with a cholesterol value that is above that threshold and, and without additional treatment might not be the, the right thing to do. Yeah. Good, good. And you know, my patients still ask me, what's my LDL? And am I below 100? Am I below 70? So, so patients haven't given up the goals either. Now, the recently published Improve It trial saw a significant improvement in outcomes when the LDL cholesterol was reduced to a mean of 53.7 on a combination of statin and azetamide versus 69.5 on statin alone. So two questions about your practice after this trial. One, are you now using more azetamide uh, or other medications on top of statin? And uh, should we lower the LDL goal, since you both now believe in LDL goals, should we lower it to 60 or, or maybe even 50? Steve, where do you stand on this? Well, you know, I, I do use azetamide quite a bit. I'm going to do it a little earlier now than I used to rather than pushing the statin dose up because we get side effects with higher doses of statins. And plus, as we're starting to use PCSK9s, azetamide is one of the requirements that we go to that before we go to a PCSK9. Good. And, and the goal, Francisco, 60, 50, okay with 70, uh, does, this, does this study change the landscape like, for example, TNT changed the landscape from 100 to 70? Is this now, is this now pushing us further down the hill? Yeah. Well, I, I do believe that uh, recognizing what is the optimal goal is pretty difficult. I think it's inappropriate to base a goal on, on the basis of the average LDL reduction or level in a particular trial group. Uh, that doesn't really mean that that's the level at which um, LDL cholesterol doesn't harm or is safe. Um, I think that's something that we still need to answer, but I think it's very clear that the improved trial uh, proved the cholesterol hypothesis, that the lower the better. We still don't know what is the the, the best level at which uh, LDL cholesterol might not be harmful. Okay. Steve, we've got a patient um, with documented coronary disease. You measure her LDL cholesterol, it's below 60. Statin? Good question. Uh, I actually had a patient like this this week who was doing everything perfectly. I mean, no smoking, right weight, good diet, etc. I said, you know, this may be a benefit because she's having recurrent events. This may be a benefit to you. We don't really have the data to support it, but it may be beneficial. And she said, okay, let's do yeah, it. Yeah. On the whole, there's not many patients like that. No, are there's there, not. But not that don't, have, that don't have a good lifestyle. Most of them, you can change their lifestyle. Okay. Yeah. Francisco, any other comment yeah, on that? Yeah, the same. And, and also might be uh, an opportunity to check the non-HDL cholesterol. 
in some individuals with an LDL cholesterol of 60, the non-HDL cholesterol may be just slightly above that. Yeah. Whereas in others uh, with an LDL cholesterol of 60, the non-HDL may be pretty high. And I would probably target that patient first. Yeah. I think the previous guideline focused more or, or allowed more latitude in terms of high triglycerides, low HDL, mm -hmm. Um, lipoprotein A, LDL particles, ApoB, now we're pretty just focused just on that LDL goal. So that's a very good point I think you yeah. make. Now, how about um, percent reduction? You know, the, the cholesterol guideline here advocated a 50% LDL reduction in the high-risk patients. Do, do you think that's really a viable goal? And uh, maybe, maybe let Steve comment first on that. Well, I mean, the, the studies that were done by the, by the companies that mostly ran these studies said we want a 50% reduction, but you have to look at that was the mean reduction. There's about 20% of people that are hypo-responders, meaning they have a less than 15% reduction, and some actually go up. Their LDL actually goes up on a statin. It's hard to believe, but they do. And we need to check them, and we need to make sure that, that they are the 50% yeah. reducer, not one of the, uh, one of the outliers. Yeah. Francisco? Yeah, I agree. Great. Do we always have a good baseline LDL? I mean, what about the ACS setting? Um, do, we know, do we know where to start from to count our 50%? You know, that's, that's a very good point. I think in many patients, we don't know what the baseline LDL cholesterol was. If we have a good electronic medical record that goes back 10, 15 years, we might have a number, but otherwise, uh, we, we just don't have the value. So. Uh, in that sense, we are stuck not knowing when and how the percent reduction was. Okay. All right, I'm going to shift gears from secondary prevention to primary prevention. So a patient comes in, uh, and regardless of whether you're using guidelines, uh, percent reduction, or, or have an LDL cholesterol goal, you've got a 30-year-old patient with an LDL cholesterol of 170. Other risk factors are unremarkable. He doesn't smoke, uh, blood pressure is, is reasonable, uh, not diabetic, fairly active, but LDL cholesterol is uh, 170. Francisco, are you gonna offer that patient a statin? Um, I will very likely offer the option. I think this is something that has to be discussed with the patient. Um, my take on that is that we treat a blood pressure of 180 regardless of the age of the patient. We uh, promote smoking cessation regardless of the underlying risk for coronary events. Even if the patient is 25, we will still recommend smoking cessation. So I don't see any reason why not to target a uh, harmful factor, which is cholesterol, in an individual who uh, might prevent the heart attack, not, in, not for the next 10 years, but perhaps for the next 30 years or, or, or longer. Yeah. Steve? Yeah, I'd certainly uh, have a discussion, like Francisco was saying, and show them their lifetime risk. This guy's going to have a very low 10-year risk, excellent, but excellent. lifetime risk is probably going to be pretty high and yeah. say, listen, this is what you're stuck with. Yeah. We need to do something now, not wait. Yeah. And, and just, just one last kind of comment on, on that scenario. You know, the new guideline eliminated low-dose statin therapy, whereas the polypill concept is give a lot of people a little bit of therapy, very few side effects, treat them over a long period of time, and that results in a huge reduction. Uh, for example, the, the early studies, um, uh, PCSK9, were looking really only a 15 or 18% LDL reduction with the genetic polymorphism, but you had a, a very large long-term term, yeah. uh, reduction in event rates. Yeah. That's a great point, Tom. If you look at Rose's Paradox, where the majority of events are gonna occur in the people that we call normal, yeah. In fact, in America this year, 25% of the patients that have, or people that have heart attacks are going to be high risk. 75% we would say they were not high risk at the time of their heart attack. Okay. Yeah. But, but the other impo important factor there is to, to keep in mind that w when we talk about cholesterol goals, uh, we are really taking a more holistic approach, uh, uh, considering all kinds of uh, methods to lower cholesterol, and lifestyle is one of those. So if we can achieve a good uh, LDL cholesterol number with a combination of statins, lifestyle, uh, exercise, nutrition, and perhaps in some patients, uh, an additional medication, uh, 
I think that's a, a more uh, patient-centered approach. Yeah, I, I find a lot of patients will accept half of the dose of statin I'd recommend, uh, and in return, they'll give me half of the dietary change that, that I'd like to see them have, and, 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 and we get to go that way. Sure. So, good. Uh, thanks, uh, Francisco good. and Steve, for your very important insights, and thanks to our viewers for tuning in to Roundtable Reviews at theheart.org on Medscape.